Yeah, thanks for, for kind uh, um, invitation summary. Thanks, Gamze, also uh, for sort of getting uh, me to, to Turkey, particularly Istanbul. This is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to not only the conference, but also hopefully finding time a bit to get better to know the city. I want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in single cell analysis. And typically, nowadays, I speak about various type of deep learning, the data integration things that we've been doing, which I think is very nice, flexible, helps us integrate things. But um, today, I want to sort of take a step back and go back to a little bit the origins where, where we, and I think many in the field, started. And you know, we had a single cell session this morning. But if you think about it, where do we know cells from? Well, obviously, this is all done from, comes from microscopy early on, right? Even though now we use these fancy genomic tools, well, you know, within C2, we maybe go back a bit. But um, what we typically do is we destroy cells, right? So it's very hard to link things across time points. And I actually started, I went into a single cell biology quite some time ago where we looked at something called time-lapse microscopy. So we actually followed up cells over time. We didn't have a high throughput sort of unbiased readout, but we could actually see what they would do, what type of genealogies they, they produce. A little bit similar to the phylogeny session we just had before. So there were interesting questions. I think we can ask them anew if we apply now these sort of modified techniques. And today I want to talk a little bit about how we've been sort of learning about trajectories, what the field has been doing, and I think where some, some of these ideas uh, are, are going. But you know, let's get started uh, simple. And so let's talk about what we want to do. Now you know, we don't have time with microscopy, so you know, we want to get an unbiased description of, 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 of cellular state. And you know, if we were doing bulk, then we would get this. So this is a uh, uh, sort of winged unicorn. I think the one thing we know about those things is they don't exist, right? So this was basically the main reason why I introduced this slide, because I really like this picture that my student drew. But you know, this is what single cell genomics would do, right? So this is obviously a composition that if we were to do bulk, this is going to be averaged out. So kind of makes sense. You know, we, it, it, it gets very noisy, but if you have a single cell resolution, you can potentially learn more. Why is this working out? Well, there's various ways, a lot of plate-based assays that came first, but I think these droplet-based realizations where we can actually barcode, so I hope this movie is going to, to, to let me click here. Maybe something like that. Maybe it doesn't like my movies. We had a transfer uh, issue, but there would be now this nice animation where you would see that those cells are captured, uh, you know, those, those little water droplets embedded in oil, capturing single cells with particular barcodes, thereby then sort of individually labeling them, and then afterwards pooling them together, and thereby being able with a pooled readout get single cell information. I think it's a fancy idea. It's really useful. And that's, I guess, why first plate-based, but then also multi-omics versions and so on have been named method of the year repeatedly. And actually also the spatial resolved version recently becoming quite popular, and I think today we also heard about uh, spatial data integration. So this gives us, I think, very exciting uh, data sets. And for me, originally coming from machine learning, this was really nice because now suddenly sample numbers were really increasing. You know, early on, when we had to do GRNs, anyone still remember the bulk era where we you know, had this small n large p, had to hugely regularize, and the whole inference was a bit tough. Now we really get into sample regimes where you know, we can do more. That's why I think why machine learning also becomes so interesting in this. So this is producing, for sure, big data. Um, I think some of the first data sets 12, 13 years ago was, I think, n equals five cells or so, one of the most efficient material used for a nature paper at the time. Now we get readily into the hundreds of thousands of cells. And you know, question, of course, comes up, what do you do with these things? So what you can, of course, do, and this is where we go into the trajectories, is, for example, in development, we can try to understand how, you know, how we get older in a healthy fashion how maybe we have been made from a single fertilized egg cell. I think it's still hugely fascinating that this has been working out. Or, you know, how different diseases develop, and that's, I think, what you can see in this sketch, that, uh, you know, across these um, um, diff different cancer or, or sort of uh, disease subtypes, there's always a developmental process involved. So if you were able to somehow learn trajectories, you could potentially learn when something goes wrong, but you could potentially also sort of reconstruct pure trajectories of health and then sort of identify then these, these sort of break off points in, in, in the case of, of disease and potentially, you know, even learn what are the driving genes at these uh, particular regions. And if you're able to do so, then, and this is sort of the last step in a sort of, I think, long-term program that the field has been undergoing. Of course, you can also try to 
perturb then these networks to get back to a healthy situation, so to think about treatment and so on. And I have very, a very brief slide at the end to discuss this potential link into the first keynote of the day today. But in any case, all of these questions, so the reconstruction of these trajectories, but then also the identification of um, branching points and so on, all of these are, I think, fun problems that we can apply machine learning to. So my lab is focusing on machine learning and single cell genomics, and we've been doing different things. We've been early on putting a lot of effort into a state estimation and, and learning trajectories. Our lab has been sort of thinking about this branching identification using some type of um, geodesic distances early on. But then we've been also putting a lot of effort into data integration. So for example, here, um, we've been trying to see if you have some type of atlas, how can you map another atlas on top of it to then sort of see how this new sample data set sits on top of it, what's different in disease and so on. But then we've been also um, putting a lot of time into uh, spatial modeling recently with these data sets becoming huge and then having all kinds of applications with experimental partners. So I, I will be not talking about this part except for one slide. Just give me one slide and then I, I, I drop the, most of the deep, deep, deep learning things and talk about the trajectories. So one of the big efforts I think that the field has been enjoying for some time is of course this human cell atlas and then downstream hub map and related efforts where you know, we came together as a community and tried to build organ-based atlases for um, different organs at some point and also cross-organ identifying immune system links and so on. And all of these essentially sort of amount to building these type of, you know, not predict system of elements, but of cell types in a sense. And I think the current ways how we analyze these type of single cell data sets, I think will change drastically once the reference become really robust. I mean, no, nowadays, nobody's really now reassembling a genome de novo, right? I think similarly, uh, very soon, we will not be de novo clustering our particular data set, but just map existing clusters on top of that. Of course, in order to enable that, you need to actually integrate and sort of make sure that these atlases are robust across labs potentially sort of reflect variation across individuals. And in order to do so, well, there's a few things that need to be done. For example, what we've been trying to do in, in, in the lung context in particular, building atlases for mouse and as well as, as human, first from a single example, but then also doing this integrated across, I think, 45 or so different data sets to really see then robustness. And then also actually enable some type of comparisons of variation that you would typically just do in a GWAS. And for example, one, one, one thing that we could do during the pandemic was then to look up where across these atlases uh, entry uh, uh, genes for SARS-CoV-2 were actually expressed and you could sort of localize them. And because we had genetic, because we had people variation, you could actually associate this then with um, individual uh, gender or uh, age. And we could see that, for example, uh, with smoking status in elderly men, you had more of these entry factors in the lung. And this, is, this was my, 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 my quick method pun, what, what we've been actually realizing and doing actually at, at a series of, of, of competitions at, at two NeurIPS actually recently, we saw that whatever we do is some type of data integration and sort of match these type of, of data sets, it's very hard to outperform some of these uh, sort of in, in deep learning based approaches that essentially take big matrices, big expression matrices, squeeze them down through these bottlenecks, blow them up again, typical autoencoder setting, but in this bottleneck then learn some type of latent space behavior. And you could do this in a conditional version for data integration in, in various variants. So this is what sort of underlies many of these approaches and happy to discuss about these in a coffee break later. But what I want to talk today about is uh, about learning trajectories. And here you see just a three dimensional visualization of a 20,000 dimensional data set, each of those dots being uh, a cell uh, about gut formation and collaboration with the Likert lab, where you see if you fly through these things that there's these pink or purple uh, type, of, type of cells that are actually uh, stem cells that would then sort of branch out. And just by flying through, you can see this is just not a uniformly distributed data set, but obviously there are clusters, but those clusters are connected. And many of the first approaches were actually just trying to learn these connections between clusters. So the idea, and this is what I want to talk today about, about single cell dynamics essentially is, can we learn something about the, can we first learn these transitions, so not just clusters, but connections between these? And then can we learn something about the molecular underpinning of these connections? And of course, if you can do so, I mentioned this before, there's a bunch of applications from development to uh, disease trajectories, but also reprogramming, potentially optimizing protocols for organoid uh, differentiation and so on. So what I want to talk today about is first, how can we learn actually dynamics, now not from time maps, but from snapshot data? How can we then add additional information, 
across additional modalities, these things are becoming more and more valuable, right? How can we include then multiple time points? And already this morning you heard about optimal transport, so this will be one of the tricks that we actually use there. And how can we leverage lineage tracing information that becomes more increasingly available? I won't speak about um, metabolic labeling, but there's also similar ideas that can be used here. And finally, I want to sort of have two more points about robust engineering of these tools in order to make this available to the community and sort of to have a quick uh, um, pickup by also biological partners. So let me start with the dynamics. I think many of you have seen this picture, Waddington's landscape, right? Sort of the representation of cell development as this, this ball sitting uh, on top of some type of landscape, then rolling down and, and each of these um, branching points making a decision. So essentially then building the actual observed lineage by some type of stochastic behavior. In practice, there's a lot of instruction happening as well, but I think it's a very nice model and, and a very nice sort of intuitive um, um, picture of what could go on here. And you know what we can do, because we have very often asynchronously observed cells, we actually, even with a single snapshot, see many of these different stages happening at the same time. So what you could do, you could just sort of group them uh, into uh, various bins. You could potentially then so root them because you know this is where, where the, the, the starting process would be. And then you essentially determine some type of distance that's sort of geodesic uh, along this, this sub-manifold of, of, of differentiation. And this is essentially the idea of many of those early approaches, purely based on similarity of the gene expression, right? And these things, this has been in the field then called pseudotemporal ordering. Early on, this was just methods such as a monocle based on min-span trees, or um, um, Wanderlust, beautifully named from Dana Pear's lab that has been sort of arranging cells by expression similarity. We did something called diffusion pseudotime that included branching. And since then, I think there's more than 100 or so different tools that have been sort of taking up this idea and then going one or the other way. So similarity is very useful. Of course, it only gets you so far, right? I mean, essentially, that's what you get in pseudotime broadening. Just get sort of a branching, sort of similar type of arrangement. But of course, what we know from physics is if you look at a snapshot picture here at my recent uh, last uh, uh, vacation in Turkey, maybe, um, of course, you can see in this picture that by similarity, I, I sure we can arrange something. But you know, because we sort of intuitively assume maybe similar time steps, you know, in physics, what we actually want is the full phase space, right? So if you really want to set up a dynamical system that explains our, our behavior, we don't want to just have state, but we want to also have velocity or momentum, right? Now, how, how, can, how can we get to that? And there's been a few, few ideas in the community to do so. The first thing, of course, would be, could we actually use time to then estimate about momentum, right? Neighboring time steps, you know, take differences, normalize, you get something like velocity. And there's some of these ideas, but of course it's not that simple because remember, we kill ourselves. So, you know, what do you actually then uh, uh, take as, as momentum? Then there's this idea of nascent RNA labeling where you can actually just say what has been generated within a, a certain time frame. And then you can also calculate something like differential quotients. And I think it's beautiful. We've been actually contributing to, to one of these analyses called single cell slam seek to do so. And these things become more and more valuable nowadays. And I'll speak a little bit about lineage tracing later. But the first thing I want to mention is that you can actually sort of use a latent information that early on many of us actually completely ignored and actually didn't even think that there's so much of this around, namely unspliced reads. And I think this morning we briefly heard about RNA velocity already, so let me just summarize this in, in one slide. So the idea of RNA velocity, beautifully put forward by Peter Kachenko and Stan Linnerson, something like four or five years ago, is, is the following. Essentially just write up a, a model for RNA metabolism, so to speak, okay? So you have... Um, your, your, your um, approximation of sort of unspliced transcript being spliced, and then you do this across the whole genome independently, so you have something like 20,000 dynamic models, and you want to estimate those parameters all at the same time. And you know, in the simplest model, we assume no, no regulation, and you know, we assume some type of global kinetic uh, uh, rates. If you do so, you can write up this very simple um, ODE system. It's linear, so we know how to solve it. There's stochastic variants of that that we've been actually also playing around, but essentially it's really nice, nice to deal with this. It's, it's decoupled, and we can then write up essentially this type of dynamics. And now this is sort of the picture, this unspliced splice plot that you would get for each of the different genes. And in each gene, you can see that if you're sort of above this diagonal, you'd have more unspliced than spliced reads versus a steady state. So what it would mean is that this gene or this transfer is just being produced, right? Whereas in the other way, if it sort of goes down there, it would be just being degraded. So you can imagine, even just from this picture, you can estimate something about the dynamics of that process. 
First methods were just based on some type of steady state model. We then extended this towards using the full dynamics. But essentially, you can then estimate by combining all of these rates that you can get from these pictures. And you know, there's some indeterminacy in there. But let's say all of this works. You can then combine it. You get a vector that's not just state for a cell, but then also where it would point to. And those you can then project again to two dimensions or something like that. You can then sort of hypothesize where that cell would be going. And particularly at branching points, it becomes quite interesting because you could then sort of interrogate that cell you know, where would it go? Is there some type of stochasticity and so on happening here? So these ideas have been around. Um, there has been actually a bit of a resurgence in trying to think more about how to get back uh, in, into these RNA velocity estimates with quite a few methods coming up recently. Um, one thing I wanted to put up here is a collaboration that we did together with Nia Yosef's lab uh, from Berkeley at the time. Uh, now from Weizmann, where we've been trying to combine this also with this embedding type of techniques that I was mentioning before. Called this Velo VI, and it's essentially uh, in contrast to this EM based model that SC Velo was that I showed you before. In, in this case, we try to combine this with representation learning. So, what we do is we take, um, and, and in particular, we, we combine it with a, um, a Bayesian model, well, at least with a uh, um, um, sort of localized uh, variational model. But what you can get, you get the cell representation, and then you have in, in your, in your uh, uh, latent variables, you have then the state assignments. You need to know whether it's been up or the down regulation side. And then you, you sort of choose your typical parameters and you can estimate some type of latent time that you can do all at the same time. And then you implicitly solve this, this ODE system in there. In this case, because everything is, is linear, you actually don't need to solve it. You can just write it up. But essentially, you sort of delegate all of this EM based work that we did before by hand into a PyTorch solver. Everything gets much more robust and, and, and behaves more nicely. And in addition, because it's a variational model, you get all kinds of uncertainty in addition. So I think that's a very useful thing that we've been using uh, uh, recently to really then help us understand you know, whether we are sure about this particular differentiation or not. All right. So now that we have this, and, and here I show you just an example for, for SC Velo. I think it would be similar for, for other cases uh, for, for Velo VI as well. In this case, this is about um, pancreatic endocrinogenesis. So this is a collaboration that, that uh, we did together with Heiko Likert's lab at Helmut, Helmut's Munich, where we ask uh, about how cells um, develop in the, um, in the early pancreas. And in this in particular case, uh, they would be starting from, from this NGN low situation here. So these more stem cells, where there's sort of a, a, a part of cells that would be ductile, where you just see mostly a cyclic, cycling behavior. But then you see sort of this transition towards NGN3 highs, so one of these, these stem cell markers uh, uh, sort of these differentiation markers being turned on and then forming these different downstream cell types. And you see by these embedded fl flow vectors, that's essentially just the visualization of this vector field that I was showing you before, this high dimension vector field that's projected into two dimensions. And there's questions that you can ask now to this stream plot. You know, this is obviously much more informative than just the dots, right? Because you know, you sort of see where cells would be going. So you could, for example, ask, what's the most likely fate of those cells that sort of haven't yet fully committed down there? Could you maybe say how those cells have been generated or you know, what type of genes are actually driving these type of things? So the questions now that you have these vector fields actually are different than just these point clouds that we were looking at before. So what, what we've been thinking about, and this is work by, by Marius, a PhD student who's, now, who's recently graduated and will uh, continue as, as postdoc uh, at, at ETH. We've been trying to think, how can we now not model point clouds, but vector fields? And those vector fields typically are high dimensional, but of course they're noisy and so on, so let's reduce dimensions as always go to a latent space. But how could we, if we have those vector fields, what, what, what do we want to do with those? What would be questions towards that? Well, first you want to know maybe what sort of next steps would be, maybe something also about the length of those steps. But the most simple things we could come up with, of course, is what would be the downstream uh, um, 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 targets, what would be sort of the the terminal uh, um, um, fates of, of uh, any of these cell types in there. So this was the idea of what we call cell rank, to not only see what those downstream states, where those vector fields would then in the end push cells would be, but also what potential fate probabilities towards these downstream states would be. So what we did is we used then this RNA velocity along the manifold of gene expressions that we calculated as a slate in space as before. But we don't do this now on this 2D UMAP, but we do this in high dimensions. And then essentially quantify a transition probability, right? For each of those cells, we know where it would be pointing in this large dimension transcript space. So you can project it to, let's say, a KNN graph or something like that. And you can try to ask, 
within a sort of, um, maybe I just visualize it here. So you can ask if, if this is the velocity vector, and then you have your neighboring cells based purely on expression similarity that we were before connecting with pseudo-temporal ordering, we could now ask, you know, which, which of these cells sort of lies close by to my velocity transition? And then I sort of assign a high probability towards this one to build a transition matrix in order to then eventually do, uh, to run Markov processes on, uh, on this, this point cloud. So we do this as, as just similar with a, a usual, with a simple a correlation kernel, and then you can build essentially a transition matrix that would tell you where a particular uh, cell would transition to in a particular time step. And then in order to now get to, towards steady states, what would you do? Well, as usual, we just take powers of this transition matrix, right? So we see where after iterative application those cells end up with, and you do some type of spectral analysis. So this is the idea of what we call cell rank, essentially just takes this spectral approach to study large Markov chains, as you know potentially from, from page rank algorithm. And in this case, actually, because we wanted to look into clusters, we needed to coarse grain the dynamics. We wanted to see sort of where those terminal set of cells would be. So for this, we use something called generalized Perron cluster, cluster analysis. Uh, and essentially, we're able now to not just calculate those terminal fates, as you can see here. So for example, in, in this developmental process, we saw this would be sort of a, a state that would be pushing cells off, and then you would sort of get into metastable states and terminal ones. But then you can also quantify fates of each of these cells, because you know something like mean first passage times or so. We know how to deal with random walks, right? So we could then, then calculate, for example, um, something like fate probabilities to each of those uh, different lineages or terminal states. And you could correlate, because this happens in high dimensional space, because you could see which type of genes are mostly associated with one or the other fate. So just to show an application, again, in this pancreatic endocrinogenesis example, we could now, for example, ask, are those epsilon cells that, of course, by biology, we do know are terminal. In this case, actually, biology is a bit more complicated. This is development, so you know, these things keep getting on, and we just at a certain time shot you don't just see so far. But at this particular time point, we know that those sh should be terminal, and we actually identify those terminal cells using, using cell rank, and then we can ask what the fates are at those different regions. And you can, for example, see that you know, even though this sort of looks in 2D as if everything sort of happens still here in reality, you actually see that you know, these, these things are sort of squished down from a sort of more complex high dimension structure just by 2D was sort of made simple. And in fact, there's a very large dominant region where better cell fate is actually being pushed out. So in, in reality, maybe this is sort of a bit more orthogonal than those 2D UMAPs would make it look like. You can ask where those alpha and, and beta cells come from, and then you can sort of quantify fates for each of these. And you can also then abstract this towards sort of some more simple structure to see where the, uh, the differentiation decisions happen. In this case, we use something called a graph-based abstraction, but there's various ways how to do this. All right. So, so, so much for, for, for the velocities. Let's now think how we could potentially add additional velo uh, information about modalities. Right? There's all these assays that quantify not just RNA, but potentially Additional in, in information, how could we use this? And one of the most simple additional information could be, for example, time points or um, maybe just more than, 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 than just the velocity fields. And why is this necessary? Well, in many cases, uh, the community has observed that RNA velocity actually not working all that well. In many cases, those, those errors, if you point them and project them in two dimensions, point in the wrong directions. And there's, there's some strange issues happening that could in parts be uh, due to um, some of the splicing kinetics not actually happen that way, but also because of, of sort of different dynamics timing. And I think the, the core example for that is hematopoiesis. You know, hematopoiesis is one of the, maybe, maybe the discipline that has been impacted by uh, single cell biology the most, because that's where a lot of these the things have been actually observed for the first time, and that's actually also being clinically used in transplantation and so on. So people have been trying to understand hematopoiesis for a very long time. And, and funnily, in this situation, things don't actually work out so well. So this is an example uh, from uh, bone marrow hematopoiesis uh, from uh, Dana Peer's um, um, Palantir paper, where you see the, the, the early hematopoietic stem cells up there that would sort of different, differentiate down here towards the monocyte and erythroid lineage and so on. And this is a typical picture that you would observe using just simple pseudotemporal ordering. But if you now run RNA velocity, what you actually observe is that those errors are typically going in the wrong direction. So there's something that doesn't go well with the splicing kinetics. And you can now ask, maybe we don't just have enough spliced genes. But turns out, so yeah, basically all of the directions are, are, are wrong, except for maybe in some very small uh, um, um, region of, of the lymphoid progenitors. 
But indeed, actually, there's enough splice genes or transcripts in there to help you then sort of contextualize it. So that's not, not reason. So wh why, why was this not working? Well, you can look into a few sort of key driver genes. And here you see that, um, for example, uh, one of these factors here, DN DNTT, actually sort of behaves a bit strange because it sort of has such a very different rate in, 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 in one of those populations. So let's maybe filter out those lymphoid population. But even without the lymphoid uh, population, these things are still bad. So it really is a bit of a puzzle why these things don't work. And I think in many cases, you, if you just look at these football type of plots per gene that I showed you before, well, they just don't look so nice. You know, in this case, it's very hard to say if there's an up or down regulation. That's why these arrows are actually not sort of sure which direction they go, because the model just don't fit well. Okay, so let's accept that. So uh, in order to now basically do better here, one of the key ideas uh, we had was, you know, could we maybe use some type of other kinetic information to anchor ourselves? You know, I was mentioning before, well, we should just use pseudo time in addition. We should use t uh, time information. We should use metabolic labeling and so on to get better at terminal states. So for this, we took the cell rank algorithm. This was worked by Philip in particular together with Michael and Marius and then modularized it and sort of came up with a sort of more flexible framework to allow for additional kernels. Typical trick, right? If you know how to deal with one kernel, let's sort of add a bit of other kernels and potentially combine these. And so what we had in RNA velocity was, uh, what we had in cell rank was just a normal RNA velocity kernel. We added a similarity kernel, and, and we also added then additional kernels based on pseudo time, some type of sort of prior information based on stemness of cells called cytotrace, time series kernel, which I mentioned briefly in a minute. We did something for metabolic labeling, which I don't mention today, but if someone interested, please come to me, or you can also use in silico models for that. And then, of course, you can also combine and fuse these kernels and see how they jointly behave. And what, what, what's now really nice is this thing is actually fast. There's a, a strong speed increase that we did because of some implementation tricks. But the key part is that we can now actually, for example, solve situations such as this hematopoiesis where RNA velocity just by construction doesn't work. And I think for many applications nowadays, I think this morning you saw briefly something where people think about using now uh, um, RNA velocity and other ideas for, for gene regulatory network inference. And there has been recently papers such as uh, cell oracle or so on that, that use these tricks. I think it's really useful to have a more robust estimate of cell transitions. So the key trick what we do here is we take the KNN graph as before, but now we also add the pseudotemporal score. In this case, sort of, you put as information that you know where things start from. And in hematopoiesis, we do, right? I mean, this is not reprogramming or something. This is really simple. We know where the hematopoietic stem cells are. So we add this, and then we essentially bias. So, so we have sort of this, this, this direct graph here that comes from pseudotemporal uh, sco uh, ordering. We have the KNN graph here, and we combine these to then essentially give us a, a similarity-based transition graph that uses uh, a pseudotemporal information. If we do so, we can then combine these two kernels and then produce a vector field or transition matrix and a downstream vector field just as before, but now things look, mu look much nicer. So if you, t if you look at this, you can just run the whole di downstream cell rank thing. So once you have the transition matrix, you just look for the terminal states. And yeah, sure, you get all the right nice directions, but also the terminal states are nicely identified as those that we would expect, you know, the, the erythroids, lymphoids, and so on. And then you can, of course, also uh, determine cell fates and, and so on. So to summarize this part, essentially we have this, this extension of, of cell rank that's faster, but particularly also modular that you can combine things and you can actually already uh, recover uh, dynamics in situations where RNA velocity may be sort of challenging. We've been putting this out on GitHub something like half a year or so ago and quite a few people have been using this already. Quite excited about community uptake of that. Another type of extension that you would like to do for these dynamics would be to actually use time point information. And, and, and this now brings us towards, um, I think, a pretty interesting question that sort of really goes back a bit more to, to the roots where, you know, I originally come from um, 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 systems biology, sort of trying to do a bit more deterministic models. And I think there's, you know, with time we can do these, some of these things. So what we typically do in the field, right, let's say we have one batch, we do a T-SNEA, UMAP or whatever. If we have multiple, we just project them together. Maybe we do batch correction. And if you have multiple time points, maybe we just ignore that and just throw it together. For example, at the moment, we're building an, 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 a developmental atlas. And there, you know, the simplest thing that you do first is just ignore it, just see where it falls afterwards, sort of do an analysis with that. You know, and and I, th I think that, that, that that's okay. But of course, there's other ideas how to deal with this. And uh, one thing that we've been doing early on is building a model for dynamics essentially trying to build a population model to see sort of how, how cells flow across this manifold in a continuous fashion. This was work of, of, of David and, and Anna. David had just moved on to the, to, uh, as postdoc to the broad. 
But essentially, the idea is quite, quite straightforward. So let's say you have, uh, in, in development, three time points, and you, sort of the, the cell densities do change over time because you know, the system is developing. So just ignoring that, just projecting it together gives you something, but you, so you, sort of, you don't use a major variant of the system. And of, of course, you know, at one time point, there might be still big variation, but you, you, you sort of try to, want, try to use this. So what you can do is you can project things together, but you can now inform the system about those potential in, uh, um, points. So for example, what you could do, you could now say, okay, here's a progenitor. There's maybe this thing here because this is early. And we can just build a very simple model of sort of fate B and C here. Something that has been happening in system biology for a very long time. You just discretize and you sort of build a, a sort of experiential transition time type of model towards those uh, different fates. We can estimate rates and you can actually do quite a lot of things. People have been using this extensively in hematopoiesis and other settings. But of course, because of all the single cell resolution, we know that in, in, in reality, you know, there's continuous transitions here. So what we did instead in, in this sort of earlier work was that we projected along pseudo time here, and then we essentially asked how these densities transition across these different time points. So we built what we then called pseudo dynamics model. Essentially, it's now a model that is parameterized by not only uh, a state, but also time. And then it's sort of parameterized by two continuous indices, so it's not an, an ODE anymore, but it's a partial differential equation. It's been a bit of a beast to solve. But you can do some things. You essentially can estimate growth rates and so on. Now, without going into detail, what you can actually sort of do, I encourage you to check out the paper, what you can actually see here is that you can now continuously interpolate those points, and you can sort of see how those cells sort of are being pushed forward on that U map. So essentially, you have a continuous interpolation of this discreetly observed process, and you get also uh, estimates of, of growth and, and birth and death rates, which you can then correlate, for example, to cell cycle patterns and so on. Okay, that, that, that was useful. Uh, sort of at the same time when this, when, when this came out, or, or we sort of put out by archive, um, Aviv, together with, with Eric Lander, in particular headed by Geoff Schiebinger, they came up with this idea of using optimal transport for sort of similar application, but actually in sort of staying in high dimension space. In our case, you know, we projected on, along these pseudo times, and they, they stayed in the high dimension. I think that's, a, that's been a beautiful example. So let me just briefly talk about OT and you know, for those of you who know OT, just enjoy a, a summary of that again. But if not, you know, just, just, just bear with me. So um, what is it? Well, OT is just essentially, well, it's just a distance between two densities, if you want, right? It's sort of an efficient way how to map two densities on top of each other. So for example, if, if you have here two time points, what you would like to do, you could potentially now ask if there, let's say, everything is nicely normalized and so on, you could ask what would be the optimal mapping to sort of transform this density into this one without sort of shifting things up apart too much. When in order to, me to measure then what shifting apart means, you we sort of need to have some type of distance between two samples here. Those samples could be now cells, for example, right? And then those, those, you know, those, those distributions that we measure could be gene expression values, and then this MIK would be just the distance of, of, of those similarities of gene expression values. And then the, 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 the sort of classical formulation of, of optimal transport would be then to find this map that transports um, uh, samples, uh, or in this case now cells, essentially by minimizing the assignment of one cell I to cell K. So this uh, cell I would be assigned to this cell K, and then would be sort of weighted by its expression distance. And then it, you would just sort of sum up of all of this and try to minimize this. And there's obviously then regularized versions of, those, of, of these just to make it a bit more efficient. It's a bit of a costly problem, but you can then construct these type of transition maps. So what we then did, you know, we just sort of reproducing more or less was what in OT did, because what in OT essentially used this just to link this across time points, where we could just reformulate this now as a kernel into the cell rank two that sort of allows to add multiple kernels. And if, if we now apply this, in this case, for example, to this data set from, from, from Joff, so from, from this uh, Lander and, and Aviv paper, um, where they've been essentially identifying cell types in some type of reprogramming situation, uh, we could see that by now adding not only the time kernel, but also uh, adding sort of the similarity kernel within a time point, because you know, now we can just put kernels together, what you could do, we could then um, um, learn also transitions across these other time points. And we can actually also then compare this to, to, to distances, and we, we see that this sort of more sort of more complex transition matrix that not just takes time point information, but within time point information based on similarities, was actually then outperforming uh, so in terms of association to real time versus sort of this just diffusion pseudo time, just sort of distance based one or, or the, 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 the Palantir one. 
And then we've been applying this to, to other situations. This is a collaboration with the, the Mare Lab for pharyngeal endoderm development, so particular endoderm development case, where you know the type of downstream targets or sort of downstream cell types were um, a bit clear, but not clear when these processes were actually sort of splitting up, whether you know those stem cells are already um, time to go in all these different ways or at which point the, the branching happens. So what you can then do, you can then run a time resolved, so Waddington OT plus internal time point um, and pseudo time run cell rank, you identify terminal states, and then you can actually also see what type of genes sort of drive into particular lineages. And that's very useful for biologists because you can then sort of see you know, what, where, do we, where, where, where do we have particular events sort of pushing one direction. What you can do is, and this is I think nice, is sort of a comparison to if you only use OT, you can also then see which type of uh, driver genes are actually recovered. And you know what you see here? If you look at these fate probabilities, now we just take one particular lineage, this, this, this MTEC lineage uh, to the left here, and uh, we see that we can just associate now gene dynamics with those uh, transition processes that, that we get from uh, our transition matrix, and we can see that we identify a bunch of driver genes. And uh, I think in this sort of uh, light color, we see which ones were actually validated, known to be associated to, to MTEC, but then we also pick up a few transcription factors that were sort of uh, not known in this particular case. And what's quite nice, if you just use the time information, which sort of very naively just links time points without sort of adding this additional similarity within a time point, well, you, you basically don't get mo most of these. So to summarize this part, OT can be used now to connect time points and you know, can be very easily integrated into cell rank. How do we now deal with lineage tracing? So this is an additional type of modality that's actually fun and I think worthwhile thinking about. You know, there's been people uh, talking about um, phylogeny. In this case, you know, this is what you typically do with lineage tracing. And that's a very important information. In many cases in development, you might have a situation where you, know, you have these, these, this bunch of cells, and they look like that, but there might be a subset of those going to a lineage that you know, maybe you just haven't observed before. So just basically just using OT might be doing bad things. You want to inform it by additional information. So that's the idea. Can we use lineage tracing information as an additional prior to sort of get us to better trajectories? So this is what we tried to do here. And yeah, I, sh I should mention this was Mario's uh, starting this actually at a, at a visit at Moani Zahn's lab at, at Hebrew University uh, in uh, Israel. So there's various ways how to do lineage tracing. There's a whole bunch of papers out there and different protocols and sort of not, not entirely trivial to do even just wrap your head around what those different protocols would do. But a very simple one is like this. And this is now not in vitro but in vivo lineage tracing where essentially you have to sacrifice a whole animal and then sort of extract its lineage. So what you would do is you sort of label those at a certain time point and then you follow up at a later time point within one, in this case, for example, zebrafish and at a very later time point in another one. So what you always get is you get lineage trees within this particular animal, but you cannot connect those lineage trees directly because those, just those lineage labels would be different in the different animals. So you have to sort of just do distances within that particular um, um, sample. And this is where Gromov Wasserstein comes in. I think you heard about this this morning, but you know, let me just again summarize it. Uh, uh, for you. So classical OT, we do these one-to-one -one comparisons. And there's unbalanced versions of that, but that's sort of what you would most straightforwardly do. In Gromov Wasserstein, what you do, you can actually then, you don't want to do now comparisons across these different, potentially even completely different metric spaces, but you, what you want to do is you want to sort of compare some type of distances within particular um, um, time points. You want to then, this could be, for example, now a similarity from a lineage tree, right? So this would be our animal one, this would be our animal two. We just compare those different uh, lineages, and then you can compare them. So this could be, for example, uh, link these, right? And then uh, if we now call these uh, uh, linking matrices CIJ, what we would do, we would then minimize a little bit like the normal OT, but we would minimize now some type of loss between those distances after uh, waiting by sort of the, the corresponding match between these cell types. And then again, we have an entropy regularization. So that's Gromov Wasserstein. And what you can now do with this, and this is the idea of what we call uh, MOSLINs or multi omic single cell lineage estimation. We can now use this Gromov Wasserstein term to link the lineages, but then we also have a di an expression distance just from the normal OT. We just combine the two and essentially have a combined cost function that we have with the typical weighting term. You can sort of select whether you just want to have the OT or the uh, Gromov Wasserstein part of things. And then we have an application to, to C elegance where we can, you know, there we do know that we have uh, ground truth uh, information. And in this case, we can um, put this ground truth in information together and then ask, you know, which particular 
cell lineage is now uh, driving, uh, is, is sort of sort of be, being selected as, as a, a progenitor cell. So essentially what we can do, we can then have some type of mean error of cells at an earlier time point being linked to a later time point, and we can combine this to, to compare this to a, a recent method called Lineage OT, also from, from Joff's lab that has been uh, not yet applied to, to, to larger data sets, but that doesn't use, that just only uses the, the, the um, um, uh, OT part and that doesn't essentially uh, use a distance, it only uses the Gromov Wasserstein part, but doesn't link um, between expression profiles. So essentially what you see across all, all of these different examples is that actually adding expression information improves quite a bit. And you know, if you just use this sort of bit drastic case here where um, um, sort of this Mosin does much better, you see that the, because we have ground truth, right, we know which cells, so what these cells at I think time point 330 or so would move to 390, that's where they should go. This is what you get from, from Moslin and your lineage tree is sort of messing this up. Okay, again, we have another transition matrix. What do we do? Well, just as before, because we have a combination of transition matrix, we, we chuck it into cell rank again and now have essentially a lineage-based kernel and we can combine them and can see what the downstream states would be. In this case, it actually becomes a bit interesting because now we can ask what would be the terminal states and we can validate this because we know what they should be in C elegance, right? But we can also ask what the fate probabilities at each of these particular time points are and what the particular driver genes are. And then, it, you know, things haven't been as much discovered already as you, as you, as you would expect. So you can now compare your, your fate probabilities. Um, in this case, for example, we looked at, at different subsets of neurons, ciliated versus non-ciliated, and we could see what's driving the one versus the other lineage because we now we have sort of our full Markov chain. We can just test for these things. And then we can come up with a, a bunch of factors that in parts we can validate, but in parts, you know, just sort of have been not yet described. We've been following this up then also with, with heart development in zebrafish. I won't show you that example. Um, the paper should be out on bioarchive essentially so hopefully uh, today or tomorrow, or something like that. To summarize, so Mosling combines classic OT with this Chromo Wasserstein part and uh, helps us to learn mapping across gene expression lineage information. And we can combine it with cell rank two to estimate uh, terminal states and driver genes. So in the, the remaining eight minutes or so, I uh, would briefly talk about the engineering aspect of things. So I think it's really fun to think about these, these problems, but if you really go towards the machine learning community culture, there's this tradition of sort of living until the next half year conference, right? And yeah, then we have, this, we have this tool out, but maybe we share code, but for sure we don't make it reproducible because you know, people won't pick it up anyway. They would just sort of take the idea and then modify the particular setting. So to have something that is actually actionable upon, well, machine learning, you typically sort of have some startups maybe do it, or, and in this case, you know, because we have, we want to get, biological partners to essentially apply these things, we have to actually put, put a bit of effort into this. And the first thing, uh, first part of effort I, I want to say for, for OT. So OT has been something that single cell has been, the single cell community has been picking up. You know, I was mentioning something like three or four years ago, what in OT being one of the first ones, but then in parallel also, so one it in OT and, and sort of related downstream things for, for temporal. But you know, it has been actually also applied in other settings, spatial. I think we heard briefly about that before with paste and so on. And a very early one from, from Monizan together with uh, um, Nikolaus Rajewski and Nir Friedman were using this actually for spatial reconstruction. Really fun application. And there's other applications for data integration, for learning full patient or, or sort of perturbation manifolds. So this, this is a useful tool because you know, it just calculates distances between distributions, you can imagine. But in many of these cases, um, so it's powerful, but in many of these cases, the implementation is, is very heterogeneous, let me put it this way. They've been using very different backends to actually calculate the optimal transport, and you can imagine that just by sort of having these pairwise comparisons, memory complexity is really bad. I mean, it's, it's squared at least. And um, temporal complexity, in particular for Gromov Wasserstein, can be even cubed. So you know, there's, there's problems there. So what we've been coming up with is to really sort of help a broader community adaptation first because we wanted to get it to run scalably in our cell rank two, but then also go beyond it. So we wanted to go beyond this fractured set of backend tools. We want to imp inc include, uh, improve on the scalability that was bad, as I was mentioning before. And we also, of course, once we have set it up nicely, we wanted to add multimodal information. 
So for this, we teamed up with a guy called Marco Coturi, one of the uh, sort of really big minds at the moment to, 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 to work in, in optimal transport, who has come up with a toolbox called OTT, which is essentially a JAX implementation, so very fast, scalable implementation of optimal transport, which sort of to really drive the um, 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 sort of speed part of things uh, ha also has a low rank approximation that actually does very well. And we came up with this thing which we call MOS called multi-omic multi single cell optimal transport toolbox. This was particularly Dominic and Giovanni together with uh, Zoe and uh, Maris and many others. Uh, essentially providing a toolbox that in various different settings, so with different problems, allow to essentially add prior information, then learn these kernels based on optimal transport, then have all kinds of downstream applications such as the one that we have with cell rank. And it performs well, it's very scalable, um, has a, a built-in support for multi-modalities, and well, we have been hoping to release it earlier, but I think we bring it out the next few months. And there's a bunch of examples that you can do with this. So for example, there has been this cell paste method to, oh no, there has been actually simpler methods just to sort of take a reference and map it on top of a, um, a transcriptome, a spatial transcriptome example. And there's various ways how to do it. I won't go into details, but essentially sort of looking at many of these approaches, you can also use an optimal transport problem for doing so. And in, in sort of in the past, people haven't done so because it just didn't scale to a full a set of, of, of sort of large-scale atlases that you want to use to then sort of inform your spatial transcriptomics data. With this thing, it was actually working quite well now. And it's very easy and sort of straightforward to use as one of the many problems that we have in, in, in MOS code. Similar example, which I think is kind of fascinating, because now it uses actually spatial transcriptomics that uh, Giovanni has been pushing here. What we can do, we can take a spatial transcriptomics profile, and we can then try um, uh, in this case, in embryo development, try to see how we can integrate multiple time points, but also in a spatial setting. So the aim now is to connect time points, but also see where a spatial population of cells will be moved to towards. So because now we can sort of merge cones, we can add the temporal and the spatial component and, and bring this together. In this case, sort of see where liver and brain in this embryo development would be pushed towards. I think uh, quite exciting thoughts of this vision of really building developmentally spatially resolved human cell atlases. So to summarize, this provides backend. Um, I think it scales well, and it also allows for novel use cases. Two things. So we wanted to go towards multiple spatial settings. So spatial transcriptomics is becoming really big. But there's so many different modalities. How can we actually put these together? We want to do spatial multimodal analyses. And for this, um, together with the Stegler lab, we came up with a toolbox of actually putting in sort of having a back end to really get you the spatially, different spatial coordinates and essentially sampling methods together. And, you know, some are based on spots, some are based on regions, some are based on pixels, some are based on just sort of really in situ positions of particular RNAs. How to deal with all of these is a bit of a hustle, but we've been able to put these together. I won't now show you how this goes because I actually want to just briefly illustrate for you that you can do, sorry, that you can do fun analyses with these. So, for example, um, some of you might have heard about Xenium, if not, I guess 10X is outside. There's similar approaches from Nanostring. And I think it's, it's, it's a really fun new technique where you can get subcellular resolution of, of, of single cell expression, but then you want to sort of map it towards your HNE stain or your, uh, or your uh, more coarse grained uh, visium or spot based assay. And in this case, what we can do, we can actually um, put all of these modalities together and then sort of see. Uh, look how fine-grained the resolution is versus much more coarse-grained cell to location, but all do this in the same coordinate system. With this, two more steps that I want to take back. Because we want to enable our, our bio biological or sort of data uh, analysis partners, we've been putting uh, um, quite some effort into writing up recommendations how we think good workflows should work. We've been putting up a, a best uh, practices uh, um, paper quite recently uh, came out in Nature Review Genetics, and we've been actually accompanying this by a best practices online uh, a book that's actually a community effort. We've been really putting um, quite some um, um, effort into making this based on independent benchmarks. And I think it's, it's been really a useful uh, thing that we did for us in the lab just to have basically the optimal one set of, of, of very well, of, of good pipelines. And if, if someone's interested in contributing here, you know, this is an ongoing thing, be very happy to do so. The second thing, and yeah, this is, this is the online book, check it out if, if you're interested. There's basically all the, the Jupyter notebooks and so on uh, go with it. The second thing is, um, you know, we've been working on, on, on ScanPy for, for, for some time. But it turns out, if you really want to maintain a community resource on a sort of a sufficiently high level, it's maybe something you shouldn't just do in your lab. 
So we've been actually pairing up with uh, a bunch of, of, of labs that sort of active in the community, in particular here, uh, um, Niers, uh, Oli Stegles, Francesca Finde-Tonellos, and Alex Wolf's labs, together with many other partners, to essentially then build what we call SC-verse. So this is sort of the, the Python-based side of, of, of single-cell analysis that then this has a bunch of, of data structures just for the normal uh, single cell, uh, for, for the single omics, there's multi omics version interfaces with, with R and Julia, but essentially then sort of has ways how to build ecosystem and ways how we do teaching. We just put out a correspondence in Nature Biotech, check it out if you're interested in this, but just go to the website if, if you're interested in the community aspects. As I just said before, you can't do these, these things alone. And then, this is my, my last slide. We had discussion about sort of bridging gaps, right? This morning, I, th I think uh, you heard about molecule, protein engineering, and so on, right? I think one potential functional readout that you could have is, you know, if, if we actually screen for compounds, you know, we, maybe we have a single cell readout of these. And, you know, these type of assays are coming out now. So the question is, can we somehow integrate this and then learn a functional readout that is gene expression that is now more informed by perturbation? So far, you know, perturbations were just delta equals one. But in this case, I think there's ways to do so. We had a, a new paper coming out just recently where we model chemical space, and I think there's many new ideas coming in this direction, which I think pharma is quite interesting to pick up. So with this, I summarize. I spoke about essentially learning uh, lineages and its outlook. I just want to say spatial analysis, perturbations, but essentially also just this sort of whole deep representation learning that is informed by digital biological priors is exciting. This I acknowledged already my partners. This is the lab, and I thank you very much for your attention.